Good morning and welcome to the United Church of Asonet on this Memorial Day Sunday. Um, it is nice to see everyone. The meditation comes from our daily bread. Thank you, God, for the beauty you allow me to see even when my circumstances seem dire. Please join me in the call to worship. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf, and Syria like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the yokes to whirl, the strips and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all say glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Our opening hymn, Eternal Father Strong to Save, can be found in the Red Pilgrim Hymnal on page 429. Please stand if you're able. Yes. Yeah. 
Please join me in the invocation and Lord's Prayer found in your bulletin. And just a note that there are two typos, so grow as you communicate, and here we are. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Renew us by your continued creative acts in the world. Your presence among us is a blessing and a gift. Open, open us, us to receive, receive ponder, ponder, and grow as you communicate with, with your people. people. In, In voice, body, body, and spirit, we worship you and invite your transformative power to be alive among us and at work in us. Here we are, O triune God, here we are. We pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning it is now and ever shall seated. Good morning again. The announcements are on the back of your bulletin. The flowers on the altar this morning are given by Kathy Amron Rogers in honor of her, her dad, the 80th anniversary of D-Day and Memorial Day. Thank you very much. Please sign up for flowers in the narthex. There are two weeks available in June and weeks in July and August. And please join us in Fellowship Hall following the service hosted by Kathy, Pauline, and Mary Lou and others. Thank you very much. And there is a sign-up sheet for coffee hour down in Fellowship Hall. Um, the Strength in the Church collection will continue today. There are envelopes in the narthex if you missed last week. And applications for Min Brown scholarship are due today to Jeff Field. Anything else, Jeff? Uh, no, uh, we, yes, I should say, uh, we will be awarding the scholarship on June 16th. Thank you. Thank you for all of you. And we will be hosting a game night on Saturday, June 15th at 6 p.m. Please bring a snack if you would like and the games that you like to play. And it's not too late to volunteer for the Southern New England Conference annual meeting and that the rest of the information is listed in the bulletin or you could speak to Reverend Greg. And we have a tentative plan in place for a July 3rd celebration, and we are waiting on some confirmation, whatever yep. that is, you talk about it. Um, and we are planning to hand out water bottles uh, with our United Church of Assonant label on it, and also small bottles of bubbles for the kids with our United Church of Assonant label on it. Um, if this works out, we will need help putting logos on both sets of bottles. We continue to collect non-perishable food items for the food pantry, and there is a box in the narthex. 
Reverend Baker's blog can be found on his website and that's listed. And Reverend Greg is in his office on Fridays for anyone who would wish to contact him. Are there any other announcements? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you. We uh, hope you're enjoying this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. As I was saying earlier, I think we're owed a holiday weekend where it's nice. It seems, I think last summer it rained like every single weekend. <laughs> it was terrible. So I think hopefully we'll be able to enjoy today and tomorrow and have a wonderful time. I do want um, to sort of follow up on some of the, um, the announcements. Uh, first, all, first of all, again, for the Southern New England uh, Conference Annual Meeting, uh, I think I've mentioned before, this is a chance for us to gather together with people from all over Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Connecticut. Uh, there's going to be some wonderful speakers. There's going to be um, some you know, workshops and, and ways to talk to people. Um, there's going to be business that gets done, which I get really excited about, but nobody else does. And so if you'd like to be involved, uh, you can get that Zoom link if you don't feel like making your way all the way out to Amherst and back. But uh, this is an opportunity to be more involved, to connect with other churches. And according to the moderator of the association, we have three delegates that we can send. Now, most churches don't send all three, but we can send as many as three. So if you would like to volunteer, uh, that would be great. Uh, in terms of the July 3rd celebration, um, again, I sent the, um, the email out saying uh, we're not going to be able to participate at the fireworks, but we would like to uh, be involved in the parade on the 4th. And I haven't heard back yet from them. I'm going to try to send another email. Um, but uh, if I do not hear uh, any confirmation, I'm going to assume silence equals permission. And we'll move forward with that. Uh, probably what's going to end up happening is on June 30th, uh, we're going to gather after church. And we're going to have some water bottles and some labels that I will have printed out. And we'll just spend a few minutes you know, putting the labels on the water bottles and having a nice uh, fellowship time together doing that. Um, one more thing, I'm going to meet with the Pastoral Relations Committee meeting uh, after church next Sunday. Um, you can see their names and numbers are in the bulletin. Those numbers are important because none of them are here in church today. But if there is something that you would like to uh, discuss, uh, bring to them about uh, sort of how the church is going or, you know, what's happening with me or anyone else, uh, this is a great time to do that because we will be having this meeting. And this is a regular meeting. There's nothing particularly special about it. It's just we haven't met in a while and it's nice to check in. Uh, one more announcement. Um, we adjusted the uh, sound system over um, this over on Friday. So hopefully it's a little bit louder. We didn't want it to be ridiculous. Uh, one of the things we did do is we fixed the microphone. So when you use the microphone, you don't have to swallow it in order for it to pick up your voice, which has been a problem in the past. And so uh, that'll be really helpful uh, in a couple of weeks when we do the uh, Mimbron Scholarship. All right. And let us know if this is helpful. Uh, I think it will be louder on the uh, camera. Uh, I may have to adjust the volume down a little bit. We'll see how that turns out today. Uh, are there any further announcements? All right, then uh, let us move on to our um, recognition of joy and concern. Uh, we have a prayer, our continuing prayers today for uh, Sandy White, uh, for Linda Wheelock, for Krista Robison, for Anne Marie Allen, for Kim Vonica, for Michael Denault, for Eunice, for Mary, for Millie Moore, for Franklin McMullen, for David Rizuski, for Pat Gonsalves, for Nick Riccardi, for Bethany Costa, for Carol White, for Bobby Files, for Tony Ribello, for Mark Joes, for Mr. Mancuso, uh, for Laura Coulter, and for Jeff Helley. I talked to Sandy White this week. Uh, she really wanted to come to church today, but she just wasn't feeling up to it this morning. But she did want to say that, um, that we need extra prayers. Uh, that she specifically said, so that I'll be out gallivanting again as soon as possible. 
And she does have another step in her treatment uh, in the not so, uh, in a relatively recent, new, not so far away. And so extra prayers for her uh, related to that. Are there any other uh, prayer requests or updates this morning? Yes, Mary? Very good. Prayer works. Other prayer requests or updates? Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, it was kind of nice going around the clock. It was a very search of that family. We were lucky enough to find it right away. So it's very right time. Uh, uh, so it'll be there until they turn it on to Christmas. Oh, really? So it's be, be for a while then? And they give it to you at the end. So that's really quite wonderful. That's just wonderful. So congratulations uh, for that. And uh, again, especially on this. Memorial Day weekend, um, we want to remember uh, your father, uh, Kathy, uh, for being a hometown hero in Taunton. Other prayer requests? Yep. Another joy. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I had quite a pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. I've noticed over the last number of years that young people really do not grasp what veterans, the name and the word veteran really mean. Mm -hmm. I don't think they think about it. I don't think they're taught about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think they hear enough about it. So yesterday we ran into the supermarket to get something and we were checking out. And the young man doing the bagging, I guess he's 18, 19, 20 or something. Yeah. He said, oh, wait a minute. And he went over and he got a flyer that said, if you're a veteran, you get like a 10% discount. And I thought that was really special mm -hmm. for him because Uncle was wearing his veteran's hat so yep. he said and he actually said thank you for your service. You don't hear that from young people. So I was surprised and I was happy and I complimented him. Oh, good. I said thank you. Very forcefully thank mm -hmm. you. So I think if you got any kids in the family, teach them a little more about what a veteran really means. Yeah. You know, and what marks Memorial Day as different from Veterans Day or any other uh, holiday is the um, ritual of going to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And if you have, um, you know, kids in your family and you want to, you know, have a little bit of time, you know, before the barbecue or whatever, and you want to take them to the cemetery and say, you know, look at the flowers, look at the flags, understand what it means to serve your country, what it means to sacrifice and to lose someone for your country, and to really appreciate the, the, the people that have done and continue to do those things. And I think it helps us put things in a, in a different perspective when it isn't just what can, what can I get out of life. Other prayer requests? All right. Then why don't we become one in a spirit of prayer? Let us pray. On this Memorial Day weekend, we unofficially welcome summer back into our lives. It's a time for recreation for, and for appreciating some of the greatest beauties that we experience in this part of the world. This weekend is a time where family and friends gather at cookouts and parties. And all these things remind us of the love and power of God who accomplishes all good things. Memorial Day is primarily a day of thanksgiving, though not only to God, but to those brave people who died in the service of their country. In doing so, they obeyed Christ's commandment of love. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So let us remember and honor those who have brought prosperity and security to our nation. Let us honor their sacrifices and the sacrifices of those who loved and lost them. Let us continue our commitment to veterans and active service persons. And let us all remember that through God's grace and through human effort, we might find a way for all to enjoy the freedoms 
essential to our identity as Americans. We pray for those in special need today, the lost and suffering, the needy and dehumanized, the ill and the injured. We pray for all those suffering from cancer and other chronic conditions. We pray for those undergoing surgery and other treatments. We pray for all who mourn. We pray in celebration for honors and for recognitions. We pray especially uh, for Sandy and for Linda, for Krista and for Anne Marie, for Kim and for Michael, for Eunice and Mary, for Millie and Franklin, for David and Pat, for Nick and Bethany, for Carol and Bobby, for Tony and Mark, for Mr. Mancuso and Laura, and for Jeff. Hear now the silent prayers of our hearts as we listen to your word for us. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. So this is so the time when I usually do something a little bit more playful, uh, sometimes more focused on children. Uh, but today, it being Memorial Day, uh, I wanted to, I was thinking of our friend Linda Wheelock, who is home right now and uh, recovering from illness. And so as such, she's not here to do what she normally does on Memorial Day weekend, and that is to read uh, the poem in Flanders Fields. So I thought in honor of Memorial Day and in honor of Linda, I would read the poem right now. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Now who here knows about this poem? Other than the fact that we read it on Memorial Day weekend. Well, it's written by a guy named uh, John McCrae, and he was a Canadian uh, physician and poet. And when he was 41 years old, uh, he uh, volunteered to join the Canadian Expeditionary Force in World War I. Now, being a man in his middle years and being a physician, they said, oh, why don't you join the, uh, why don't you join the medical corps? But he said, no. My family have always been fighters. I'll be a gunner and a medic on the front lines. Now, at the Second Battle of Ypres, uh, in April of 1915, McCray's unit was hit with one of the first chemical attacks in the war. Now, if you know anything about World War I, a lot of people used to think that war was exciting and glorious. But in World War I, um, when there weren't no, there was not, uh, armies running across fields to, to meet. Instead, they were uh, digging in trenches and having machine guns and poisons dumped on top of them. All the glory of war uh, disappeared. And McCrae described the horrors of this, the second battle of Ypres to his mother. And he wrote, for 17 days and 17 nights, none of us have had our clothes off, nor our boots even, except occasionally. In all that time while I was awake, gunfire and rifle fire never ceased, even for 60 seconds. And behind it all was the constant background of the sights of the dead, the wounded, the maimed, and the terrible anxiety lest the line should give way. Now, 
again, two weeks into that conflict on May 2nd, one of McRae's best friends, a man named Alexis Helmer, was killed. And McRae performed the burial himself. There was no one else to do it. And as he looked over the simple graves that had been put up across uh, the battle area, he noticed that poppies had quickly grown up around them. And inspired by this image of this new life coming out of such terrible tragedy, he wrote the poem in Flanders Fields the next day while he was riding in the back of an ambulance. Now, since then, this poem has been a way to honor those who died in World War I. It was used in prayers. It was used in recruiting uh, posters during the war. And it continues to be a symbol of remembrance for those who have uh, passed away in wars. Um, it's a way that we can, when we think about the poppies, we think about the other flowers that we put down at the graves of fallen soldiers as we've done in the United States uh, since the end of war, uh, the Civil War. And so that I hope that as we think about all the beauties of this weekend and all the wonderful things that we have in our lives and all the things we can celebrate, we can remember um, those flowers growing on the graves and the promise to continue to seek freedom no matter where we can. So will you please pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for flowers. We thank you for freedom. We thank you for all you are and all you do through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The triune God gives with abundance for the flourishing of community. We did not receive gifts, blessings, favor, and resources for ourselves alone. We are created to be communal, compassionate, and generous. So let us bring our gifts forward with gladness and gratitude that we have the honor of participating in God's liberating and redemptive activity here in the world. This morning's offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Generous God, may we give gifts that are sufficient and abundant as you have provided creation with all that we need to flourish. May the fear of scarcity give way to the joy of sharing. Magnify the resources we bring as we cultivate generosity within us so that all needs are met and all your people may be well and whole in your name. Amen. Our hymn of preparation today comes from the Red Pilgrim Hymnal and it is number 251, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let us all sing together. The scripture this morning, the Old Testament lesson is from Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and can be found on page 518 in your pew Bible. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The Gospel Lesson According to St. John, Chapter 3, Verses 1 through 17, can be found in your Pew Bibles on page 780 to 781. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after growing, having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Here ended the reading. Good morning again, everyone. Today I want to talk about how understanding ancient Trinitarian heresies can actually make your life and your family's life happier and healthier. All right, who thinks I'm going to be able to do that? Raise your hand. I'm not seeing anybody raising their hand, which means either you're not paying attention or you don't think it's going to happen, but let's find out. So the doctrine of the Trinity is only hinted at in the Bible. Uh, for example, the book of Isaiah has the seraphim sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, implying that there's something threefold about God. And the Gospel according to John speaks about one being born of the Spirit and of the God who gave his only Son. 
And so there is a reference in the story to God the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit, all essential parts of God and essential parts of our salvation, even if we don't have precise details about how they relate to each other. Now, because of these unclear biblical teachings on the Trinity, most of the doctrine about it is based on the experiences of the faithful and the theological reasonings of the great thinkers of the church. Their conclusions, which were hammered out over hundreds of years, form the basis of what we would now call orthodox theology, which are ancient ideas upon which almost all churches agree. Now, in the case of the Trinity, we are taught that God has three persons within one divine essence. Now, each person is fully God. None are identical to each other, and yet there is only one God. And while each person is different, they all act as one. The Father does not do one thing, and then the Son does another. They all act together. So, this idea of threes and ones, you know, these, uh, these Trinitarian formulas are kind of mathematic in a way. It's very uh, logical, you know. And typically, math does not move the heart to faith. And so people have been using analogies since the beginning to try to better understand the Trinity so that it does touch our hearts. However, one really thing that's important to recognize about the Trinity is, is that it represents God as being unknowable. God is beyond our human comprehension. God that doesn't have to make sense. And so when we do try to explain the Trinity, we regularly fall into what is called heresy, which are beliefs that conflict with those or that orthodoxy upon which other people agree. So, and when we look at some of the more well-known analogies for the Trinity, uh, we generally fall into, I'd say, about four different categories of heresy. All right? Now, let's look at a pretty basic one. And I like to call this one the Three Musketeers. All right? Unfortunately, this has to do with the novel, not with the candy bar. All right? So, there are three musketeers. There's Orth uh, uh, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. And... They would not be the three musketeers unless they were all together working, you know, sword fighting and stuff. Now, this idea of three people becoming one group together uh, might be fall into what we would call the heresy of tritheism. That states that there's actually three gods instead of one. And so, while the three musketeers are only the three musketeers when they go on adventures together, uh, they also can go off on their own and do their own things. So there's no reason they have to be the three musketeers all the time. When we think about God, we need to remember God is not a club. If we think about God in this way as, as three different persons that occasionally are united, we might think that one person is more important than another. And when we think this way, we might commit ourselves to that person within God that we like the best. And in the end, we end up justifying our own desires, the stuff we like, more than anything that's greater than ourselves. You can see why this might be a problem, believing in a God that's no greater than ourselves. Another example of the Trinity is the Trinity is like water. Anyone heard this one before? Trinity is like water? All right. So again, water can be, sometimes it's a liquid, and sometimes it's solid ice, and sometimes it's gaseous vapor, but it's always water. Now, this demonstrates the heresy of modalism. And this is when the persons of the Trinity are just seen as different modes in which God acts. Uh, they're not truly unique persons. Uh, for example, we say, well, we have God the Father who is the creator. So whenever God is creating, that's the Father. And then we have the God who ties the church together, and that's the Holy Spirit. So whenever God is tying the Holy Spirit together, that's the Holy Spirit. But those are just things that God does. And the reality of the persons is just those actions and not the, real, the wholeness of God. These modes have no ultimate meaning. And again, when we think this way, we might see God in the way that we want. But we also might stress God's unity so much that we miss how important this 
diversity within God is to how we treat one another. We can't have a God that's three gods that barely relate to each other. We can't have a God that's just one God with maybe three different uh, hats, right? Now then there's the, the analogy for the Trinity that I bet you all know. And which one is that? It's St. Patrick's analogy for the Trinity. And what's that? The shamrock. All right. So uh, Patrick taught that a shamrock has three leaves, and yet they all connect to form a single clover. Now, this exemplifies the heresy of partialism, which states that the God, the persons of the God are only a part of God and not fully God. You know, um, and while God does have diversity, God does not have parts. This opens up the possibility of, again, only enjoying the parts of God that you like. And it also opens the idea that God is not fully omnipotent because the Father is not fully omnipotent. The Son is not fully omnipotent. Only when they're together is omnipotence found. And that the idea that God is not omnipotent means that we don't need to follow what God has to say. You can see why that might be a problem. And the fourth analogy I'm going to bore you with is that God, the Trinity is like the sun. You know, the Father is the distant star, the Son is the visible light, and the Holy Spirit is the invisible but uh, felt heat. Now this falls into a heresy which is called Arianism which is named after the theologian Arius, who taught that the Son, who was incarnate as Jesus Christ, was not fully God, but instead was a creation of God. So we have God, but then we have Jesus, who's not as good as God. You know, and just as the light and the heat of the Son cannot exist without the star, if Jesus or the Spirit are just creations of God, then there's no reason to see Jesus as divine. You know, um, or Jesus' incarnation as essential to our faith. Because Jesus doesn't save us, therefore Jesus is just a nice guy, right? And without faith in Christ, we tend to worship an impersonal God, one who did not dwell among us. And an impersonal God really rarely touches our lives. An impersonal God is very hard to pray to. And so we miss our faith in God. Another problem with this heresy is that it creates a hierarchy with God. We have the Father who's the most important, the one that's really God. And so this can make us feel like some people are more important than others, and like those lesser people might be ignored or dehumanized. Now there's some other models for the Trinity, like there's the rainbow, there's the human mind, there's God as love, that I think work better than these, but there's always some falsehood that slips into whatever analogy we use. Whenever we want to talk about God as Trinity, it's like we're on the edge of a knife, and we always end up falling on one side or the other, never quite where we want to be. But the Trinity, I think, should point to a fullness in God that includes unity and diversity without sacrificing either one as less important. So I think, or I hope at least, that I've demonstrated how a fully Trinitarian view of God can have a big impact on how we live our lives of faith, because how we understand God impacts how we pray to God and how we act as people of faith. But I also think that having this idea about who God is impacts how we think of ourselves and how we treat other people as well. Because Genesis teaches that humanity was created in the image and likeness of God. And if we are like God, then we should also be like the Trinity. And if our understanding of the Trinity is off, that can then impact how we can be off in the ways we treat one another. When we see God's diversity as an illusion, as in modalism, right, we understand that God is primarily an individual. And if we are created in God's image, then we too should be understood primarily as individuals, as individual creations, each made by God. Now, thinking of yourself as an individual is a very good and important thing. It allows you to find uh, self-fulfillment. It allows you to express yourself in unique ways. It allows you to do the things and to be the person that you want to be. It helps you discover what your unique destiny is that God has planned for you. 
But individualism, uh, individualism is also essential for us to thrive as humanity. We have to be ourselves. But individualism, when pushed too far, can lead to selfishness. You know, we think of our own happiness above that of others. You may overstress the things that make you satisfied. And when you do this, you're more likely to try to get more and more of the things that you think make you happy. Um, you might um, see others as just tools for your fulfillment. And you uh, make other people seem like they just exist to make you happy. Uh, Overconsumption can also harm your relationship with the planet and its resources. When all you care about is your own individual happiness, it's hard to care about long-term disasters as long as your comforts are not affected in the present. So individualism can be a good thing, but if it's done too strong, if we overstress it, we could fall into a lot of bad things. Another problem with overstressing God's unity can be found in the uh, hierarchies we see in Arianism. In this system, only those in power are truly individuals, just like only the Father is the true God. Everybody else is secondary. And so when we have this kind of hierarchy, it means those people at the top are the ones that really matter. And when we think about tyrannies of kings and emperors of ages past, you see what happens when we have a hierarchy where God is at the top and everything is below God. That means the king gets to be at the top and everyone else is below that. We fought a war 249 years ago uh, to say that maybe that's not a good way to live as human beings. Now, so we can see in these two examples, these two heresies of modalism and Arianism, that focusing so much of God as a unity can lead us into some bad behavior. So therefore, we should see God as a diversity, right? We should think of diversity. Diversity is a wonderful thing, right? We're always hearing about how good diversity is. Because we cannot be fully human unless we recognize there's difference among us and we live as people who are connected with others. We can't, no man is an island, right? Now, believing in a diverse God therefore helps us to appreciate all the difference and the beauty around us. It allows us to humble ourselves before the needs of others and to seek out a world where everyone has a place and no one is excluded. However, oversizing, overemphasizing God's diversity can be just as dangerous as overemphasizing God's unity. Because if we fall into the heresy of partialism, uh, whereby God is only God when all the parts are working together, we might fall into the dangers of what is called collectivism. In collectivism, all that matters is that larger whole. Any individual is disposable. Anyone who speaks out of turn or tries to express their individuality is a threat to be removed. And this can lead to societies where conformity is seen as the only way to live. And any deviancy is to be treated with shaming, ostracization, and violence. Collectivist systems can also devolve into hierarchies where some people dominate all the others who have no true say in their lives. All right. Now, if a partialist way of looking at humanity makes us nothing more than cogs in a machine, and a more tritheistic dogma makes our differences as the most important things, and this leads to another problem we see around us, the problem of factionalism. Now, just as some might see the sun as more important than the spirit, we might see our group, our race, our nation, as more important than others. And those others might be seen as threats, as less than fully human, and worthy of derision, or silencing, or violence. Now, think about all the problems we have in our world today. All the things we read about online, or read in the newspapers, if we still get those. All the suffering we see in our lives. I think we can see these dangers, these dangers that we can personify in all these ancient heresies, these problems of individualism, of hierarchies, of collectivism, of factionalism. You know, none of these things make us happy. None of them make us look like children made in God's image. We're on the wrong side of thinking about God. We end up on the wrong side of being true and loving people. So what, therefore, is a truly Trinitarian way of being? How do we live as people who are fully human, fully unique, and part of one common humanity? 
Now, I could go into all sorts of crazy ideas. I've been talking about that for a while, but I want to think more immediate, more small right now. I want you to think about a family, maybe your family. Now, I think we know families that are broken, ones where everyone just looks out for themselves, or where only what uh, a patriarch or a matriarch wants is what matters, or one where one must sacrifice their differences to belong, or one where jealousy and infighting splits a family apart. But what does a good family look like, a healthy family? What does a holy family look like? I think it's one where people put the good of others above their own needs. I think it's one where everyone is respected, even the ones that seem weird. I say that as someone who is both the golden child and the weird one in my family. I think it's one where everyone is listened to, even the voices of the youngest or most vulnerable. I think it's one where keeping the family together is more important than getting your own way. Are your families like this? I bet some days they are and some days they aren't. Because families aren't just one thing forever, right? Being a family does not mean that everything is perfect all the time. But it means that everyone strives to be more loving and less selfish. And faith works the same way. Even if we have the right beliefs about God, even if we can sort of um, catch ourselves in that knife's edge between all these dangerous ideas... How we actually live into that relationship with God changes from day to day. Sometimes we are right with the Lord, and sometimes we fall off and we slip into sin. You know, every day we need to pray and refocus ourselves with the people that God wants us to be, and that's not easy. But having a plan, a vision of who we want to be as people, as families, as communities, as nations, as a world. This is what allows us to work, to sacrifice, to get to that place. So I want you to spend some time, this Trinity Sunday, thinking about all the confusing marvels of God. But then I want you to spend tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, trying to be the person that God has created you to be. Let us pray. God, you appreciate us in all the little things that make us unique. And you bind us together in love. Help us to love you and love others in our thoughts and deeds. And this we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn today comes from the Black New Century Hymnal. And it is number 273, Praise with Joy the World's Creator. Let us rise if we feel able and comfortable, and let's all sing together. divide 
Celebrate the Spirit's treasure, foolishness none dare deride. Praise the Maker, Christ and Spirit, one God in community, calling Christians to City. Thus the world shall yet believe when shown Christ's vibrant unity. And now, let me remind you that there is a wonderful spread in honor of Memorial Day downstairs. And let us now go in the blessed presence of the triune God who cleanses you, calls you, and empowers you to be messengers of God's love in this world, even as you are surrounded by God's all-consuming presence wherever you go. Go in peace, my friends. Amen. Let us turn to our neighbors and sing. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Thank you.